So um, anyhow, that'll be fantastic. Tom's going to share the Word of God with us this morning. I'm looking forward to this. I believe that Tom has uh, got a word for the church this morning. Amen. God bless you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Spirit of God. Spirit of God, I pray that it will be revelation and truth and life for us today. That your word is powerful, it's sharper than a two-edged sword dividing between the soul and the spirit. Father, I pray that it would, be, it would be more than just information, but it would be revelation. Father, that we see from your perspective and understand from your perspective how to work and operate with you and walk with you. In Jesus' marvellous name. Let's turn in our Bibles to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. Jesus said these amazing words. Verse 15. He's asked Peter, he said, who do you say that I am? And it's most important that we understand this is our foundation, isn't it? That we understand who Jesus is. And Peter answered, of course, he said this. He said, Simon Peter answered and said, you're the Christ. You're the Messiah. You're the promised one that's going to come. You're the son of the living God. And Jesus answered, he was looking for this. He was looking for the revelation. He'd asked them numbers of times, who do people say that I am? Who do you say that I am? He was looking for the revelation that he had, they'd got a hold of this. And he said, you are blessed, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. You've got a revelation from God. This isn't just somebody telling you this. You got this from God. And I say to you that you are Peter. He changed his name from Simon, which is a reed, to Peter or Petra, the rock. And on this rock, this revelation truth that I am the Christ, the Son of the living God, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. You know, there's only three times where Jesus spoke about the church. But hundreds of times, I think it was over a hundred times, he spoke about the kingdom of heaven. And so we've got to understand what this means. So I want to break this open a little bit, if I can, this morning. He said, I will build my church. The word for church there is ecclesia, or as Greg likes to call it, ecclesia. I like to call it ecclesia. I don't know how you're supposed to say it, but that's the word, ecclesia, the original term. Now, this term was very commonly understood in Greek and Roman culture because it, it represented something very, very powerful. There were two very powerful spiritual terms that the Jews represented. One was the temple. The temple was where they went to give sacrifices and honour and find the presence of God. The other was the synagogue. In the synagogue, that was the gathering where they went and gathered together to hear the word of God and discuss the word of God. So we have the temple and the synagogue. But here's the thing, Jesus did not say, I will build my temple and all the kings of the earth will come to it like the queen of Sheba came to Solomon and bow the knee and all the kings will come to bow the knee in my temple. He didn't say that. He didn't say, I will build my synagogue into a great worldwide network of synagogues to make the gospel available to people in every nation. No, he said, I will build my ecclesia. The ecclesia was not a Jewish term. It was well understood in Greek and Roman culture. The ecclesia actually means something different than temple or synagogue. But we have associated over the years the church with those two things. We have associated it with the temple. And oftentimes now, we say, oh, you know, we're driving, there's, there's the Anglican church, the building. Or there's the, there's the um, Presbyterian church, or that's the Catholic church, the building. We associate that word church with a building, but that's not what it means. Or we associate it even with the gathering. You know, that's, that's and we associate often gatherings with the pastor of that gathering. 
don't we? Isn't that how we use our language? Oh, that's Neil's church. Well, that's Greg's church. That's Joe's church. That's Harry's church. That's the pastor's church. We associate it with the gathering. But Jesus didn't say that. So let me, I, I just want to break open to you what the word ecclesia means when we look at what it meant to those people in that time that understood it in the Greek and Roman perspective. Because Jesus said he would build that. He would build his ecclesia. So if he's going to build that, we need to understand what that is that he's going to build. Are you with me this morning? Yeah, it'd be good to understand what God is trying to say. The term referred to a secular institution operating in the marketplace. He wasn't talking about the temple. He wasn't talking about the synagogue. He was talking about a secular institution that operated in the marketplace in a governmental capacity. So what would happen was, when we understand what he's saying, it can bring a significant shift in our perspective to what Jesus wants to build. You know, in the early church, in a very short period of time, they influenced that whole arena around that place. The New Testament church transformed cities in a very short period of time. Its objective was the transformation of people and society, not just a gathering of believers. And I believe that has not changed. That is the purpose of God, to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth. That is his purpose. That's what he wants to do. He still wants to do that, and he wants to do it through you and I. Hello? That, that's what he wants to do. Until the kingdoms of this earth become the kingdoms of our God, that is our purpose, to have influence. He says, I've called you to be the salt of the earth. If the salt loses its savour, what good is it? Anybody here put salt on their dinner? No, one, two of us, three, yeah, yeah, we understand. When you put salt on your dinner, do you just put it on a little bit or do it just go over everything? It goes over the lot. Go over your vegetables, over your meat, over, you know, this and that, over, over your greens. All the people love their greens, yeah. And, uh, you know, I've been eating vegetables for a couple of weeks now, only vegetables, and... I'm so enjoying eating some protein again, I can tell you. Anyway, that's another story. But we put salt over everything. But if the salt loses its taste, it loses its flavour, what good is it? We're supposed to be a light set on a hill, not hidden under a bushel. I don't know what that means, how you hide it under a bushel. All I can think of is a bunch of wheat. What's the light doing under there? I don't get that. But we're supposed to be a light on a hill. We're supposed to put the light out. It's supposed to shine forth. We're supposed to be the leaven that goes through everything. You put a little bit of leaven in something, and anybody here ever done any baking? I've done a little bit. You know, not a lot, but a little bit. You put a, put a little bit, just a pinch of leaven in some flour, and it goes through the whole thing, influences the whole thing. Is that right? Those who bake know what I'm saying. Is that right? Anybody a baker here? <laughs> Son of a baker. It goes through everything. So we're supposed to, as the church, have influence. We're supposed to have light. We're supposed to be the salt. We're supposed to have influence. We're supposed to flavor everything around about us. We're supposed to flavor our society. We're supposed to have something that makes a difference wherever we go, not losing our savor, not losing our flavor, not losing our influence. Are you hearing this today? That's the heart of God for the church, to have influence. So when he says he's used a secular term here rather than a religious one, it's, it's significant. Two years after Paul planted the ecclesia in Ephesus, all who lived in that Roman province heard the word of the Lord, Acts 19 verse 1. That's about a million people at the time. That's a lot of influence. They had all heard the word of the Lord. How many of you would like to know that your influence has gone out to a million people? That's a big deal. Hello? Two years. That's all it took. Here's what the ecclesia is. That, that was all without military or government support. The ecclesia was the ruling body sent into a city to establish the laws of Rome and make it a Roman city. It was headed up by an apostle, which was also a Roman term. So we have the apostle would go out with those 
ruling body, the ecclesia, to transform that place to become a Roman city. So when Jesus said, I will build my ecclesia, I will build my ruling body that will go and transform that city to be a Christian city. You see? You see? This is the purpose of the thing. This is what God wants us to do. So when he used the term ecclesia, he wasn't saying, talking about just the gathering of believers. He wasn't talking about the building. He was talking about the ruling body. And he went on to say this. I will build my ecclesia and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. He did not discard the concept of the temple or the synagogue. He says he, we would become the temple where the presence of God would come inside of us and he would inhabit us and out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. The Bible says the voice of God is like the sound of many waters. And when you and I speak in tongues and out of our belly flows the rivers of living water, that's the sound of God coming forth. It's the sound of the voice of God as the, as the many waters are flowing. Are you hearing this? Jesus was the Word made flesh, but we are the flesh being made the Word. I'm diverging. I better get back on track. So, huh. the Romans had something called Conventus Civium Romanorum, or Conventus for short. What the Conventus was, according to Sir William Ramsey, uh, uh, well, someone who studied this, when a group of Roman citizens as small as two or three, gathered anywhere in the world, it constituted the conventus as a local expression of Rome, automatically bringing the power and presence of Rome into their midst. Let me say that again. A group of Roman citizens, as small as two or three, when they gathered together, it automatically brought the power and presence of Rome into their midst. It was the Roman ecclesia in a microcosm. In Acts 16, the Roman magistrates, they panicked when they realised they had thrown in prison a fellow citizen without due process according to the Romans. Same thing happened again in Acts chapter 22. They said, oh, he's a Roman citizen. We've got the conventus happening here. We've got Roman law. We're breaking Roman process here because they understood the power that when a couple of Roman citizens got together, it was like Caesar was in the midst. When Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together, there I am in the midst. You seen the power of this? They understood this. We've got to understand it because it's not part of our culture. So when we understand the power of this, when Jesus said, I would build my ecclesia, I will build my, my, my group of people who will carry my authority wherever they go. They will carry and be the salt and influence that place. They will be the leaven that will influence everything around about them. They will be the light on a hill who will bring the light of the gospel to them. They will be my authority in that place to bring the laws of heaven onto earth and to bring the kingdom of heaven into the earth. That is the ecclesia. It's the ruling authority. It can also be translated assembly. They are the assembly of my people. That's the ecclesia. Is this making sense to you this morning? Jesus said, I will build my ecclesia and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Hello? That's, see, it, it changes the whole perspective. Now, this is not to, to negate the role of the apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists, the five ascension gifts ministries that we have in Ephesians chapter 4 when he says, I will give gifts unto men after he ascended. I will give gifts, the apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists for the, for the edification, for the building of the saints for the work of the ministry. Now, a saint is not somebody who has done three miracles and has been ordained by the Catholic Church. A saint, according to Bible terminology, is somebody who has received Christ and who washed in the blood. That's you and me. 
you are the saints. Hello? So when we get the Ascension Gift Ministries to empower the saints to do the work of the ministry, it's about you doing the work of the ministry. It's a shift. What happened in, uh, I think it was 1711, King James? Anybody heard of King James? Anybody got a King James Bible? Hello? King James was not a godly man. We can think he's a great bloke because he, you know, got the Bible into English. But he was not a godly man. William Tyndale was one of the first ones who was very accurate in the translation of the Bible. But King James was an ungodly king and he believed in the divine right of kings to have authority over everything. So he got together 47 scholars to translate the Bible and they had 15 directives from the king. And one of those directives was to translate the word Ecclesia into the word church, and he was the head of the church. Hello? And even today, the Queen of England is the head of the Anglican Church. Did you know that? Yeah, that's right. But Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together, there I am in the midst. It's a very different perspective. It's not hierarchical. It's a really different way to look at it. So when two or three are gathered together, that's where my authority is. When two or three agree on earth concerning anything, it shall be done by my Father in heaven. Let's read it in the Bible just to prove that it's there. It's in Matthew chapter 18. Two chapters over. Verse 15. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. In other words, try and reconcile. One thing we don't hear much about these days is, you know, we should reconcile and resolve problems, resolve conflict. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear you, take with you one or two more that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he refuses it, take it and tell it to the ecclesia. The church, the ruling, the, the two or three. That if he refuses to even hear the ecclesia, let him to be to you like a heathen and tax collector. Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you release on earth will be released in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. He's talking about the ecclesia. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. I used to think of it like this. Can I have a few volunteers to come out and show me, help me with this? Jim and Heather, Deb, can you just come and stand up here for me? Right? I used to think it was like this. That we had two or three people gathering together. So you're gathering together, you're having a nice little um, study here. Okay, they've gathered together in my name. Here I am, I'm coming along and joining them. I'll just join this because they've gathered in my name. But that's not what the Bible says. It doesn't say that. It says, there I am in the midst. It's when we look at the concept of Ecclesia, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Now, if you have a look at a vine, it's only made of branches. So here are branch one, branch two, branch three, or one, two, three, you have whichever number you like you can have, right? There is the vine, the three of them. That constitutes, represents Jesus, the body of Christ. He's the head. He doesn't come along and join in. That is the identity of Christ right there. That's the ecclesia. Is it, you see what I'm saying? It's a different way of looking at it. They represent Christ. They carry the authority of Christ. When two or three agree... They carry the authority of Jesus. You see this? It's not like suddenly Jesus turns up. No, they carry it. They're, they're it. He's in them. He's in us. We abide in him. He abides in us. He is there because that is the identity. Together they make the vine. Thank you so much for being great vines. <laughs> I'm, I'm just trying to shift your thinking here because we get so hierarchical with this when we think about authority. 
when we think about what Jesus said. <laughs> he said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now he said this in a town, I think it was Caesarea Philippi. In Caesarea Philippi, there were three temples. There was the temple of Caesar, which represents government. Neil spoke a little bit about our government earlier. And I would just say this very, very quickly. For those of us that have to go to the temple of Caesar next week and vote, vote for righteousness, please. Don't just vote for personality. Don't vote for party. Have a look at policy. Have a look at what they represent and vote for righteousness. Okay? As Christians, we get an opportunity. That's our say. So please, vote for what is right. Have a look at what the policies are for the gender fluidity. Have a look at what the policies are for, for sanctity of life, for abortion, for euthanasia. Statistics are that the countries that have got euthanasia, up to 5% now of deaths in those nations are by euthanasia. Children disabled as low as eight years old are being euthanized. It is not a good thing. So please vote for righteousness. Have a look at their policy. Let me get back on track here. The gates of hell were, the gates of Hades was an actual place in this town. It was the darkest spiritual place in Israel. And it was a place where human and animal sacrifices were. There were three temples. There was the gates of Caesar, uh, the temple of Caesar, the temple of Pan, which represents idolatry, and the gates of Hades. The gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Jesus was saying the darkest spiritual place in Israel shall not prevail against the ecclesia, the called out ones, the ones authorized by him. When two or three are gathered together and have agreement, the gates of hell cannot prevail. Hello? We've got to understand the power that comes when we get into agreement with one another, when we represent Christ as his body. There's nothing spiritual that can stop it. Nothing. Nothing. There is no authority that can stop it. That's the gates of Hades. The gates also mean the entrance to something. You know, in a, in a city in those days, the elders would go and sit at the gate and they would decide who came in and who went out of that gate. In other words, they were deciding what was going to happen inside of that city. They got to decide who we're going to let in. We're going to let these people in. Should we let them in? Should we not let them in? They decided at the gate. Jesus told us he would give us the kingdom of heaven, the keys to the kingdom. He gave us the keys to open the gates of heaven and allow heaven to come to earth. Is this making sense? So he gave us the keys to the kingdom of heaven and the gates of hell should not prevail. So we can shut the gates of hell. We can shut the demonic strategies and the demonic plans. We can shut them down and not permit their garbage. And we can allow the goodness and the grace of heaven to come to earth. That's the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Uh, are you seeing this? There's all this language about gates here. Whatever you release on earth will be released in heaven. So what we released down here in, the, in that context in Matthew 18 was about forgiveness or, un, or you know, whether, whether people were going to walk in righteousness or not. So we can, we can hold people bound with unforgiveness or we can release the grace and mercy of God to them. We can release the goodness of God over people. We can stop demonic strategies. We can bring the grace and heaven and power of God and bring joy and liberty and life and allow the river of heaven to flow through us and bring all that God is. Whatever we release on earth will be released in heaven. Whatever we bind on earth will be bound in heaven. We as Christians should not be the ones who are bringing the curse. Hello? You know, I've heard some Christians saying, you know, I'll curse that person and oh, God is going to bring judgment and... and I don't know about you, but I don't, I, don't, I don't want judgment. Jesus did not come into the earth to condemn the earth, but that the world through him might be saved. For Jesus did not send his son to condemn, but to redeem. 
So we're the ones that should release redemption. We can release redemption on the earth. Are you hearing this? Rather than, oh, God's going to judge us because we've done a bad thing. You know, we've got laws for, we've got some disgusting laws at the moment. And, uh, you know, oh, God's going to judge us. God's going to judge us because of this or because of that or because of abortion or, you know, you can name it. But, but I want to be the one who decrees redemption to our nation and brings the kingdom of heaven to our nation. I'm believing for a reformation for our nation, not just the move of the spirit, not just that the churches would flourish and grow, but that our nation will be redeemed, but that our nation will be reformed by the power of his spirit. I pastored a church in a little town of 10,000 and I was the 15th church in that town. 15 churches in a town of 10,000. You think, man, that's the Bible Belt. Man, that'd be a great town. Oh, man, that should have had everything going on Christian-wise. I tell you, no, it didn't. We were still missing the mark somehow or other. But somehow, as a nation for Australia, if you can hear my heart, I'm believing for Australia that we'd be more than just having another congregation that we would have something that would transform our nation back to righteousness, for righteousness exalts a nation. That somehow or other, it wouldn't just be at the temple of Caesar with the politics, or the temple of Pan with the idolatry, or at the gates of hell with demonic strategies, but the kingdom of heaven would be released into our nation, that we would see a transformation to deal with our stuff, that there would be reconciliation of families and bringing wholeness that there would be righteousness, that the pubs and clubs and the places where people go to carnality would be shut again. I've got a friend. I'll give you this example. I've got a friend, a Scottish fellow, who comes from Glasgow. So he speaks in a really broad Scottish accent. You can hardly understand a word he says. So he speaks in this Scottish accent. And he's a FIFO worker, fly in, fly out. And he was working on Barrow Island. Anybody heard of Barrow Island? Okay. Barrow Islands off the coast of WA. And he'd go there for a month and then come home for a month. So it was like he only worked six months of the year. But he was talking to me about that. And he said, you add up the number of hours he worked, it was actually the same as everybody else. He worked long hours when he was over there. He was an engineer in charge of 90 to 100 men building this, I think it was a, a gas uh, refining facility. There were four to 5,000 men at that place at any one time. And he was so depressed because he would go there and it was just an ungodly environment. Everybody was using foul language and there was no honour and respect. And it was just a really difficult place to work. He lives just up here in Budrum, great guy. So we encouraged him. He said, well, why don't you have a bit of a gathering and see who would come and have a church service or just meet, have a Bible study. He said, there's no other Christians in the place. Nobody there. Oh, what am I going to do? <laughs> we said, just try. Put a note up on a notice board that you're going to have a gathering, going to sing some worship songs, study the Bible. So he didn't think there was one other Christian in that place. He put a thing up on the notice board. The first time he got five people. After a few months, they had 100 men gathering every week. There'd be different ones praising and worshipping, leading the praise and worship, different ones preaching. And they had this great gathering. He said the whole environment in that place shifted. He said it was a joy to go over there. He'd meet with these other guys that encourage one another. The presence of God would come. And he said it was just marvellous. They were being salt. They are having influence. Where two or three gathered together, there Jesus is. And he began to have an influence in that place to the point where he was almost sad that he had to stop going to work because the construction had finished. And they all went a different way. People were, men were getting saved, they were getting ministered to. They were, the, the life of God came into that house, into that place, into that workplace. In a totally different environment. Instead of him going and coming home depressed every month, he went there looking forward to it because he knew that there was a place where they could connect with God. See, that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to have influence, be the salt of the earth. Is this making sense to you today? We are the ecclesia. 
we're the assembly of God. We're the called out ones. It's not just about the gathering under the pastor. It's about how much difference are you making in your workplace? Are you being the salt of the earth? Are you being light? Are you being leaven? Are you making the difference? The gates of hell shall not prevail. We have the keys of the kingdom of heaven. We have life. Where two or three are gathered together, there is Jesus. Make a difference in your workplace, man. Make a difference in your home, in your gathering. Make a difference. Be light. Be leavened. Be the ones who will carry the presence of God wherever you are. I think it's so interesting that God has called us to be man and woman in a marriage where two or three are gathered, there he is. And one of the, some of the most powerful prayer times that I've had is just when Deb and I are praying. We get together. I mean, I spend some time in prayer on my own. I pray. When Deb comes in, it's like there's just something so powerful when we come into agreement. God comes into that place. Are you hearing me today? I'm believing. <laughs> I am believing. I'm believing for God to come so powerfully into our nation. I'm believing for God to, to change the dynamic in our nation. I'm believing for God to, to, to transform and redeem. I'm believing for a reformation that will bring our nation back into righteousness, into a moral and ethical righteousness, not just in, in its church, but in its government, in its workplace, in its homes, in, a, in, in relationships. God spoke to me some time ago when I was just in a real broken place where I'd lost everything. Where I'd lost my ministry. I'd lost my finances. I'd lost my marriage. I'd lost my money. And to a degree, I'd lost my mind. God spoke to me and said, I'm going to restore everything to you. And I was so broken, I had trouble believing it. But one of the first things he ever told me was he would never leave me or forsake me. <laughs> and he never has. And bit by bit, God has restored to me. Not the same as it was before. I've got a different wife. And I'm very grateful. I've got a wife who loves me to bits. Sometimes I don't understand why. He's restored to me my mind so I can think clearly now. Can, I can walk with God. I can, I can comprehend. I'm getting depths of revelation now that I never had before. It was so powerful, Margaret. Talking about brokenness is the part. It is. God has restored to me some ministry. I stand here before you as a testimony to the redemptive grace of God. He's restored to me. He will fulfill his word just as, as he's promised me. So he will speak to you and lead you and guide you. And you can take your promises for you. I take his promises for me. But some of the things that he has spoken to us as a church, as a congregation, should I say it's a better term to use, rather than church, rather than assembly, as a congregation, as part of the whole thing called the body of Christ, as a congregation, he has promised us that we would be a voice to the nation. He has promised us that we would flourish, that we would be financially doing okay, that we would have the young and the very, very young, that we would have a, a strength to be able to sow out people into the world, that we would be able to do some of these things. God has promised us. That is a prophetic word that he has spoken to us through numbers of people. He has promised us. Now, if we look naturally, we can say, how could that be? But God is well able to do what he said he's going to do. Hello? He did it for me when I couldn't even see how. He restored to me and promised me. And God has spoken to us as a congregation, and I want to remind you of this congregation, that that is what God's promise is to us, that we are going to have significant influence into our nation. We are going to be the light. We are going to be the leaven. We're going to be the salt of this nation. We're believing for it. I'm expecting it. He's promised it to us. He's speaking to us again just this week. He's promised us and, and refreshed that thing to us afresh that God is going to do it. 
God was telling me earlier this week, I was praying about a situation. I think, God, what are we going to do about this visa for Greg and how, you know, when, what, where, why, and how's it all going to happen? And I just felt God speak to me afresh and say, there is not one hesitation, there is not one hold up, there is not one thing that's going to stop his plan or purpose for what he has for us as a church. I believe it and I'm expecting it and I'm praying for it. It's, it's in me and I want to just encourage you that God has his plan and purpose for us as a congregation. Not just individually, but as a congregation. There is nothing going to stop what God's going to do. Thank you, Jesus. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your encouragement today. You're speaking to us by your spirit, by your power to encourage us. As we stand in faith through these very interesting times, Father, we believe you for the reformation. We believe you for the transformation of our nation. We believe you, Father, that you will lead and guide and you'll do whatever it takes to get us there. We believe you for it in Jesus' name.